Microphone doesn't like this shirt. <laughs> Bizarre. Okay, today we are looking at O Come Thou Wisdom from On High. And uh, what we're examining is Jesus being the wisdom of God. And this is actually a messianic title that you find of Jesus Christ. Uh, because Christ is the wisdom of God. If you can look in your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And uh, we'll be in a few different places this morning. But 1 Corinthians 1.30 says this about Jesus Christ. Uh, but of him... You are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. And then Colossians 2.3 shares with us a similar concept. Uh, let me read Colossians 2.3 to you. Colossians 2 verse 3 says this, In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. But let me show you where in the Old Testament we have this idea that Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus being the Christ, the Messiah, uh, what prophecies say he would be the wisdom of God? And what you're going to see is that we don't have this kind of direct prophecy where, like Isaiah said, Jesus is the wisdom of God, you know, in the same way that he said, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, you shall call his name Emmanuel. What we have is Proverbs chapter 8. So I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs and go to chapter 8, the passage that we just read in our morning scripture reading. And I want to look at that again. And the book of Proverbs is a book about wisdom, right? And where does wisdom come from? Uh, where, where does wisdom start but with the fear of the Lord? In the middle of Proverbs 8, we have wisdom kind of personified. Wisdom seems like a person. Uh, and in fact, throughout most of Proverbs, wisdom is a female, actually. Uh, now, before you ladies get too proud, so is folly. Folly is a female in the book of Proverbs as well. But in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is this female who's crying out and inviting people into her home with hospitality, saying, just come in and partake of what I have for you. And then you have at the end of the book, Proverbs 31, remember that, uh, that woman who uh, is to be highly esteemed for all the things she does? You know, that's not just some passage about a woman in general. It, it, it's a woman that is wisdom personified. So the end of the book of Proverbs is summarizing what the whole book has talked about, Lady Wisdom. Well, in the middle of this Proverbs chapter 8, where wisdom looks like this person, uh, we have a description of the creation of the world. And in wisdom literature in the Bible, it often incorporates ideas from Genesis. So uh, this is just for your own Bible study later on. Ecclesiastes is basically a commentary on the book of Genesis. Proverbs has themes from Genesis. The psalm we read this morning is called a wisdom psalm, and it contains ideas from the book of Genesis. So Proverbs chapter 8 is going to incorporate this understanding of Genesis, but it's going to say wisdom was there at the process of what happened there in uh, Proverbs, Genesis chapter 1. So look at Proverbs 8 verses 22 to 31. Uh, let me read that to you again. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Uh, what is that saying he possessed? He possessed wisdom. So the Lord had wisdom at the beginning, but, but now it's going to kind of describe wisdom almost like a person. Before his works of old, 
So that means wisdom existed before creation even happened yet. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning before there was ever an earth. That word beginning keeps repeating it to remind you of Genesis. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. Okay. Uh, now brought forth is, we'll talk about that in a moment. Let me read the whole thing. Uh, when there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet there had not been made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew the circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. So this wisdom sounds like a person that is right there along with God while God's creating all the elements of the earth, whether it's the land, the sea, the sky. Wisdom is right there just kind of cheering God along. And not only excited about it, but engaged. Wisdom is described as a craftsman. So wisdom is partaking in this, whatever's going on. And so, as the ancient church studied this passage, they thought, wow, you know who this sounds like? Jesus Christ. Uh, and indeed, I think God is giving us a kind of prophecy in here. And it speaks of wisdom being brought forth before the world began. Now, this is a doctrine that the early church established, uh, you know, about a few hundred years after Christ, but few thousand years before us. The idea that Jesus Christ was brought forth from the Father. Uh, the ancient church fathers described it this way, that Jesus Christ proceeds from the Father. Now, that does not mean he was created, because the early church also said this about the Son, Jesus Christ. The church said that Jesus Christ eternally proceeded from the Father. Okay? So that means Jesus always was with the Father at the same time. Whenever you have Father, you have Son as well. It's not that the Father existed for a few years and he's like, yeah, I'm bored, and then he brought forth Jesus. It's that Jesus was always brought forth at the same time that the Father existed. But it shows you just uh, this idea of the Trinity and how each person of the Trinity has kind of unique function. The Son always proceeds from the Father. The Son always is brought forth of, of the Father. Okay. Now this is deep in the weeds that were, uh, of creeds that were worked out a long time ago. But if you go uh, too far one direction and, and you don't say that Jesus came forth from the Father, then you are saying Jesus is the Father. He's not the He's basically the same person of the Father. There's no distinction. And then you don't have a trinity anymore. You have two gods always existing. But if you say Jesus was brought forth from the Father in the same way uh, that I brought forth my children, Suzanne did most of that work, but uh, if you say that my children came forth in the same way that Jesus did, now you're saying Jesus had a point in time when he didn't exist, and then a point in time and when he did. Okay. And that's not right either. So you have to kind of go right in the middle and say, Jesus Christ was brought forth from the Father. That's why the relationship has always been Father and Son throughout eternity. So one comes from the other. The Father does not come from the Son. The Son comes from the Father. But this going forth, this proceeding, this begetting, as the old King James says, was always in existence. Jesus Christ always came forth from the Father, but 
All the time that God the Father existed, Jesus Christ was always being begotten of the Father. And that's why John says that he is the only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ. He's that unique one that existed being begotten of the Father, but forever existing. You're all looking at me like, wow, what in the world, right? It's deep stuff, and it kind of blows my mind. But we do have to have this grasp on the Trinity and know that our church fathers worked this out and thought through, okay, you can't say this because then you have this heresy and you can't say this because of this. One of the texts they used was this book right here, this section. The fact that wisdom, which is Jesus Christ, was there present in creation, but he wasn't created first and then everything else was created. He was there the whole time. But at the same time, he was brought forth of the Father. But just because he was brought forth of the Father, don't say that there was a time God existed when Jesus didn't. So that's how you not be a heretic. <laughs> you say Jesus Christ was brought forth from the Father, but there was never a time when the Father existed that Jesus did not. And that's what Proverbs chapter 8 is showing us. It's a prophecy. It's, it's showing us, it's really giving us insight into the Trinity. That Christ was there at creation. That the world was made by him. And then what does it close with in verse 31? He rejoices in the inhabited world. And what is his delight? With the sons of men. So Jesus looks at creation and he's there for the whole thing. He's doing the work. He's the craftsman. The Spirit of God is the one hovering and guarding creation from those chaotic waters. Jesus is the one crafting everything. God is the one speaking the wor world into existence. And at the height of creation, humankind is created and Jesus delights in that. And Jesus looked at that creation knowing full well that they would fall from the glory of which God put them. And Jesus looking at that creation, it says he's a lamb slain before the foundation of the world in the book of Revelation. So Jesus looks at that creation, knows that it will reject him, that he made the world, and yet the world despises him. He looks at that and says, this is my delight. I, Father, will die for these. Father, I put my hand up. I volunteer to die for these ones who will reject you. And that's what Proverbs is showing us. Jesus is that wisdom from on high. And this is what the early church taught. This is how the early church taught the doctrine of the procession of the Son, Jesus Christ, from the Father. In fact, I wasn't doing to prepare for this. I was just doing in my own reading a church historian named Eusebius. And he uh, brought up this very passage as I was reading. I'm like, oh, wow, the Lord just brought it all together. Uh, he brought up Proverbs 8 as a passage that shows us Jesus comes from the Father, yet he always existed when the Father existed. So Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus shows us the wisest way there is. Now that wisdom that's from God, James says it, it's wisdom from above, right? And we need to be born again or born from above to have this kind of wisdom. I want to contrast the wisdom of Jesus Christ with the wisdom of the world. So let's talk a moment about, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't give you that last uh, fill in the blank there. Let's back up and summarize what I just said. Wisdom is described as being brought forth by God before all creation and instrumental in the creation of the world. These are all attributes which are held by Jesus Christ. So I did all that preaching and forgot I had a nice, good, succinct summary. Uh, so there it is. Here's why we believe Proverbs 8 is talking about wisdom, because it's described as being brought forth by God. It's described as being before creation. It's instrumental in the creation of the world. Those attributes belong to Jesus Christ. They don't belong to an angel. They don't belong to a person. They don't belong to any created thing. This is also what distinguishes us from Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe that God first made Jesus and then Jesus made everything else. Okay? No, Jesus eternally came from the Father, not at some point in time. 
and his delight was in the sons of men. All right, let's move on now to contrast the history of the world's wisdom as opposed to God's wisdom. And the history of wisdom in the world starts out with this idea, or at least the history of wisdom in the Western world. This is a very Western perspective. Wisdom was first described as seeking the most virtuous way, right? Kind of the best way of living, that's what wisdom was. It was the philosophers thinking, what is the way to live best in this world? And by best, they didn't just mean getting your way, getting what you wanted, but living in a way that really blesses you and blesses everyone else and helps humanity thrive. It was a noble pursuit. And in the ancient times, the earliest writings we have about philosophy are from a guy named Plato, right? Uh, he also was just this wonderful designer of this uh, you, you kind of clay-like substance that you added uh, a little bit of wheat and water and kneaded it together, and then you add some food dye to it, and you would have these beautiful colors, and then he gave it his name when he gave it to the world. It was called Plato. Uh, but <laughs> This is why you need wisdom, because I'm going to throw stuff in like this every once in a while just to keep you on your toes. Uh, so Plato taught that wisdom was the ability to understand eternal abstract truths about reality. So, like, uh, here's what he thought about, let, let's just take a horse. Wisdom was being able to, okay, you look at that horse, and, and a, a scientist would look at a horse and say, a horse is a mammal, a horse, you know, he can carry your, your, your cart, uh, a horse likes to eat this stuff. A horse smells like this. Plato would say, here's real wisdom. I look at a horse, but I actually know the essence of horse. I know the eternal concept of a horse. And I know this horse in front of me isn't, it's not really a real horse. Real horse is just this eternal horse quality that exists in the mind of God. Right? So this eternal abstract truth, you know, so it's kind of the difference between something particular and something general. When I say to you the word car, what do you think of? Okay, you might think of maybe some sort of concept of car. Now, depending on how you grew up, we all have like individual thoughts of what a car is. But what are the basic things that make up a car, the eternal truths of a car? Well, four wheels pretty much and you drive it, you know. I would say internal combustion engine, but that, I mean, our parking lot doesn't even have everything. All the cars have that. So, yeah, you know, our concept of what a car is versus if I describe to you a 2006 Scion XB, you know, that is a particular, right? That's my toaster. You know, it's rusty. It makes vibrating noises. Uh, its back handle is falling off. It has lights that are supposed to illuminate the license plate. They're kind of hanging down, like dangling, like Christmas bulbs. But they're legal, you know. Uh, that's a particular. Now, the concept of car is, well, there's four wheels on it. It's a car. It gets you places, right? So Plato is all about the concept of stuff, not the particulars. But wisdom is knowing the, the eternal concepts. Well, then you have, in contrast to him, this guy later on that comes on the scene, Aristotle. And Aristotle emphasized that wisdom is the ultimate cause. And what does every cause have? Cause and effect, yeah. So Aristotle was all concerned with, he looked at the world as a bunch of causes and said, I want to know or, uh, the world in a bunch of effects. He sees all of us and everything going on. He was scientific. He observed, uh, you know, not cars, but horses. He observed bugs and he observed people and said, here's all these effects. What are the causes? I want to know those eternal principles behind that. So he looked at the ultimate cause of everything, which meant there was an effect. He also looked at wisdom as, he kind of looked at two different ways, this, this cause and effect thing. And then he looked at, 
all right, what is the practical, non-theoretical, like, wisdom that, you know, kind of where the rubber meets the road? So he's more of an engineer, where Plato's more of a philosopher, okay? And all of Western thought can be kind of broken down into how much are you team Plato, how much are you team Aristotle? So Aristotle wants to know what works, not what is, but what does, you know? Tell me how something works. This set the stage for what we're going to see throughout Western thought, the idea of pragmatism. Just give me what works, not what is in these, you know, pie in the sky ideas. Give me what works. Give me the brass tacks, just the facts, man. So then by the time you get a post-Renaissance, 14, 15, 1600s in Europe, we have modernity, it's called, and it brings us some new ideas, such as those of uh, a, a guy who wrote a book called The Prince. His name was Machiavelli, and uh, we, to this day, use this adjective. Oh, he's very Machiavellian. Uh, what that means is, you've heard this phrase before, the ends justifies the means, okay? So, uh, as long as I get something accomplished, as long as I get the effect I want, the cause of it doesn't matter, right? So, whatever it takes, I'll make it happen, right? So sometimes you see this in the modern church. We can fill this place if we were to hand out $10 bills to everyone that came every week, right? I mean, we could fill it. Uh, hey, go to the tab, the $10 bills, you know? But that's pragmatism. The end, uh, you know, having people here in church does not justify the means bribing people with $10 bills. Now, we instead choose hot dogs, but that's another story. So with this shift in modernism, you know, it kind of focuses on the Aristotle view. Let's get something done. That's real wisdom, getting it done. Not thinking about all these ethereal ideas, but get it done. Let's get it done. Get her done. Okay. With that idea of modernism came a rejection of worrying about how we get there. Let's not worry about all the morals and what's right. Plato would encumber us with that. Let's just get it done. Get her done by whatever means possible. Okay? So no longer is virtue sought and that the, the most wise thing to do. It, it's now about whatever gets you, gets what accomplished, that what you want done. It's about getting it done. It's about the ruler uh, having his way. Now, I have a few years, uh, you know, kind of parallel to this at the same time, a little bit later. We have John Locke, who a lot of our nation was founded on his ideas. He brings us the idea of empiricism. And what that is, is that knowledge comes through you experiencing things that you can test with science. Knowledge doesn't just come about through thinking about things like Plato did, about thinking of the essence of horse. It comes through you testing out a horse, right? Uh, so it doesn't matter to think about what makes up a car. What matters is, uh, you know, the, the mechanics of the car, how it works, what the science shows us. So truth has to be proven by that which works best. This is a result of a guy with a beautiful name of Francis Bacon, uh, Mr. Bacon said, we can only trust that which we can test and work out, the scientific method. Now that sets the stage for how we think about many things today. So leaping to our modern day, we value that which pragmatically works. We value the latest and greatest technology. That is what, you know, whatever Apple is bringing to the table, that's what we want. And if you don't want Apple, it's because you know something that probably works better. Or all you Samsung nerds that claim it works better than Apple. Apple works better, all right? Uh, just give it up, right? But that's modern technology. It's just this drive to create better things, more efficient, to create ends that uh, are better, that, that justify the means you've used. We're not, we don't care about seeking virtue. That's not part of our culture. Our culture values the most technology, getting the job done. 
That's who makes the most money in this world. And that, who is, that is who is valued the most. Those who have the latest information and are up on all the latest things. What's interesting is that goes against what most of history has thought about wisdom. Because that values the young and that values the latest and greatest. Most of history, wisdom was thought to be owned by those who were the oldest and who had gone through things. They had experience. They fit the criteria of Dr. Bacon. Uh, they have experienced the truth. You young whippersnappers haven't experienced it yet. But we don't like old people waxing on about how times have changed. We want to hear new people and what do they get accomplished. They produce results. They make us money. So now we're driven by guys like Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, because they get it done. Now, what's happening on the side in all of this, bringing us into this modern age, are uh, a couple of Germans like Nietzsche. He comes along and he says, it's not about virtue anymore, it's about getting what you want accomplished. And as I look at all of history and as I look at all ideas, it's all just your will and a fight to power your will in, in there. Will to power is what Nietzsche said. So wisdom is ultimately you getting your way through power. So everything's a power struggle. We have another German, a guy named Karl Marx, who comes along and says, history is just one story of the struggle of the oppressed and the oppressor. Those in power, those without power, and those without power are gonna rise up and take over the powerful. But then that cycle just goes on endlessly. And that's real wisdom. Okay. So that's where we are today. Where we are today is we've moved from seeking virtue now to seeking that which works. Now it's created some wonderful things, right? We live longer now than at other times. We have, uh, we have amazing technology. You know, people have done all these studies about what the average appliance brings us, you know. A dishwasher, if you think about a, the machine, the dishwasher, you know, all the hours of human labor that that accomplishes. You know, to, to think that this sermon is being recorded and I could go on YouTube and find out that someone in Africa is watching it, you know. Okay, these are amazing things. I'm not trying to knock technology. But in the end, what's the heart behind this? And what does that mean about worldly wisdom? And here's what we see this history of the world, to sum it up, the wisdom of this world is not concerned with what is right or what is virtuous. It is concerned with what works for number one, me. It works with uh, who is God, I'm God, I'm the one who defines good and evil, so what works for me? So let's contrast that with the wisdom that's from above, the wisdom that Jesus Christ shows us. Let's first peek over at 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. And what's amazing about 1 Corinthians, it's dealing with the, a bunch of Greek people who have this history of thinking about wisdom. And here's what the Apostle Paul says about wisdom. Uh, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So here's what biblical wisdom does in contrast to the wisdom of Plato, Aristotle, Locke, Nietzsche, Marx, Elon Musk. Biblical wisdom says that if we give up what we think works for us, the greatest gain will happen. That's what the cross is. The cross looks like foolishness because Jesus did not seize any power. In fact, he gave up all his power. That flies in the face of the world. Marx is right in that often history is this struggle between people looking for power 
Nietzsche's right when he says most everyone in this world is just looking for will to power, how to get my work done. Jesus gets his work done by giving up power. That's what meekness is all about, that biblical concept that you don't find praised in other world systems. The idea that I will reign forever and I will rule the world if I die, that does not happen. That's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus is worthy of all praise and adoration. He is King of kings and Lord of lords because he gave his life for this world. And that seems like foolishness, but that's what the cross is. And that is the contrast between pragmatism, that which works, and that which gives up. Biblical wisdom is a wisdom that gives up, that gives to others. And that was shown clearest in the cross. Now let's turn over to James chapter 3. This is an extended passage on wisdom. James 3. And we're going to just see a number of uh, contrasts of biblical wisdom versus the world. James 3 verse 13 says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him think about the truest form of something, like Plato. Let him figure out how everything works, like Aristotle. Let him will to power, like Nietzsche. No, who is the wise and understanding? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter and envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. See, that's what Jesus was, that wisdom from on high, as we sing in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's not the wisdom that's from above. It's earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, not will to power, will to yield, right? Uh, Without partiality, oh sorry, misaligned, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of wisdom is sown in peace, by those who make peace. Wow, what a contrast with the history that we just recounted. So let's just sum up what biblical wisdom looks like as opposed to the world. Biblical wisdom says our actions must be virtuous to be wise. That's what it said in verse 13. If you want to know that you have true understanding, show by your good conduct. So there is a kind of pragmatism, but It's not the end justifies the means. The means have to be good all along in order to know if the end is of any use. So what I do in the process of accomplishing the main thing I want done, how I live in the meantime really matters. Okay? You know, you could preach the gospel this way. Tie a track to a rock and throw it in someone's window. You could say, hey, I just delivered the gospel to someone. But the means is pretty bad, right? Now, that's a ridiculous idea, but think about that in all of life. The means by which we do things matters. Wisdom is, as the earlier philosophers looked at, seeking virtue while trying to live the best way. Biblical wisdom is also about being humble. Biblical wisdom humbly seeks the good of others, not self. That's what James was describing here when he said, willing to yield, not boasting uh, that it's um, done in meekness. It doesn't have bitter envy and self-seeking. If you are selfish, you are not wise. Now that's in contrast to those who would say, oh, just, you know, the end justifies the means. Uh, There's a philosopher, Ayn Rand, who was big on this idea of, we have to stop, you know, she she was opposed to all the liberals who just want to make you give your money to socialism and all that. And so a lot of conservatives like her because she said, Let's stop being so nice to everyone. We'll actually make more money and everyone will have more money 
if we kind of look more toward just building our own empires of money. And that's what her books are all about. And on the one hand, I appreciate her critique of socialism, of forcing people in this progressive way. It rarely works. But on the other hand, her wisdom is totally bankrupt and sad. I, I read her book this year, uh, the big one, um, and the one about trains, as earlier this year. And it's, it's so sad. Because it critiques the problem of trying to make other people share the wealth. But at the same time, her answer is, so just be selfish. Uh, that's not from above. It's not wisdom. It's not wisdom. It's wisdom from below. Biblical wisdom is not based on just what the senses experience. All right, so John Locke and Francis Bacon, you know the truth if you can test it in a lab. No, Plato actually had something when he thought that wisdom was in the mind of God, and if we could attain that, you know, we'd be wise. Plato was on to something there, because what our senses have is not everything. This world is not all that there is. And in fact, uh, it says here that wisdom... In verse 15, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. Often when we think of sensual, we, we just think of, uh, you, you know, lust. But the idea of sensual is that it appeals to all the senses. That it's taste, touch, feel, smell. It's, it's sensual in that we can test it out. And that's not all of what wisdom is. So biblical wisdom is not just based on what we experience in contrast to these Enlightenment thinkers that think the only truth is that truth that a scientist figures out, or in contrast to the way we typically use sensual, the sexual revolution that's been happening since the 60s, that whatever your body wants to do, do it. Whatever your body craves, fulfill it. And that is wisdom. That's the best way to live. Live your truest self. So if your body wants to be whatever, just live it out. If your body wants to be a dog today, be your truest self. If your body wants to be a female today, go ahead and do it. All right. Uh, that is if you're a male. If you're a female, you know, switch it around. Whatever you want. It's not all sensual. And in the end, verse 18 now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Wisdom is a fruit. Wisdom is the fruit of what God does for us in Christ. It's not our human achievement. Okay. Here's where the ancient philosophers got it wrong because they didn't know Jesus. Well, in fact, some of them lived before Jesus, uh, Plato and Aristotle. But... Their idea of wisdom was, let me pursue living the most virtuously I can. The trouble is, we have a nature that does not want to do that. A corrupt nature that we have inherited from our forefather, Adam. So because of that, none of us will ever fully achieve the virtue that we ought to. We all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 says. So although Plato would love to grasp the mind of God... He will fall short of it. Wisdom is fruit of what God does in you, not something that you achieve on your own. So if you have not bowed to God and said, I don't have wisdom. I trust Jesus, the wisdom of God, on my behalf. I believe that he died in my place. If you don't trust that, you don't have biblical wisdom. That is where wisdom starts. You see, wisdom lives in the most virtuous way possible, what the ancient Greeks taught. But wisdom is also the most pragmatic way in that it really lives the best way. Its results are the best. Wisdom is pragmatic. It does work. Whenever we try to go our own way, it doesn't work. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end thereof is destruction, it says in the book of Proverbs. So Jesus is that wisdom from on high. Trust that biblical wisdom today and contrast it with the world's wisdom. So back to our whole uh, series we're in. We're in the middle of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And in the coming of Jesus, God is with us. 
God is with us as wisdom. If God is with us as wisdom, if God is with us, he has shown us the wisest way to live. Let's pray. Our Father, please give us that wisdom that comes from you. Please exalt Jesus Christ in everything we do. If there are any here today who don't know him, may they trust him. May they trust that wisdom that's from on high as opposed to worldly wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray.